I can't imagine going in front of Radcliffe. I don't, you know, she felt so tall but formidable uh -huh. and not being prepared to do a pitch. <laughs> being not prepared, prepared to my do worst it. nightmare <laughs> so, to do that. Okay, well, our, our second author is also from Bold Strokes, Barbara Ann Wright. Uh, Barbara lives in the Austin area with an army of pets, which she apparently is trying to sick on any literary critics if they don't say nice things. Uh, she pets fantasy and sci-fi, and we keep encouraging her to do more sci-fi. <coughs> her first novel was the award-winning Pyramid Waltz. To date, she's published 11 novels. The last one is Tattered Land. I'm going to read you a, a short description of where I'm going to read from in the Tattered Lands, just because it is a fantasy and it has magic and magic creatures and such. Um, so uh, it's a standalone fantasy set in a different world where ten magical pylons protect the one remaining human kingdom from a creeping horror called the Tattered Lands. And in this scene I'm going to read from, Vandra, a human alchemist, is going to investigate a problem with the pylons. She's accompanied by her twin siblings, Fita and Peter. The three humans are being observed by two elf-like beings called Seely. One is Lalani, daughter of the Seely Empress. She has taken a particular interest in the humans. Her teacher, Phelan, is less enamored and thinks all humans are dangerous. Luckily, the Seely can shroud, turning invisible, so they're hidden from Vandra and her siblings so far. But the humans can't do anything fancy and are about to be ambushed by other humans while the Seely watch. It's really not as complicated as it sounds, I promise. <laughs> so I'm going to be switching back and forth between Lilani and Vandra's POV, and this one starts with Lilani. Watching from the trees, Lilani tensed. The three humans she'd been following hadn't seemed to notice the other group of humans crouching behind a tangle of brush. Those waiting had weapons in hand, and her group continued blithely forward. Lilani took a breath, ready to shout a warning. Don't even think about it, Phelan said from beside her. But they don't see the danger, she said. When her group of three split, she gasped. Look, the smallest one has even fallen behind and the other two will be ambushed. Lilani, he said, don't. Lilani ground her teeth. The small female who'd almost seen her in the forest was now alone and vulnerable. Lilani wanted to protect her, but how? Creep up behind and warn her? More movement from the south caught her attention. Another human ran past a clump of trees on the other side of the road, racing toward the small female's unprotected back. She wore leather, carried a club, and had a focused, cruel look on her face. The small female was doomed. Her armed compatriots were now too far away, and she hadn't noticed the assailant behind her. Lilani shook off Phelan and ran. Her magic shuddered, but desperation pulled it close. Shrouded, she burst out of the trees. Ahead, the ambushers sprang at the small female's protectors. But the protector's weapons seemed to fly through the air as they fought together. They'd subdue their opponents in no time, but they wouldn't be able to help the small female. Lilani ran harder, her breath coming in gasps. The wind rushed past her ears and she tore through the grass. The small female turned, no doubt drawn by the, drawn by the sound of Lilani's footsteps. She spotted her would-be assailant instead and froze, her mouth open. The assailant grinned. The small female obviously wasn't a warrior. Neither was Lilani, but she wouldn't let herself think about the consequences of her rush at that moment. At least two against one was better odds. Vandra, Peter called, run! Vandra's body wouldn't obey. By the time she heard her attacker coming, all she could do was stare. She noted the club and the cruel grin on the brigand's dirty face, but her rational mind refused to catalog them in any way that made sense. The club lifted and Vandra raised her arms. She closed her eyes and tensed for the shock and pain. When the brigand shrieked, Vandra flinched, but no blow came. She opened one eye to see the brigand flying through the air as if blown by a strong wind, her club tumbling from her hand. Well, now the world made even less sense. The brigand lay in the ditch, cursing, her eyes wide. Vandra looked to her own hands. Had she done something without knowing? Perhaps an adrenaline-fueled reaction? She took a step forward, and a woman blinked into existence before her. Vandra gasped, and the mysterious woman's purple eyes went wide as they locked gazes. Their skin was nearly the same shade of brown, but the mysterious woman had dark blue hair, a sight Vandra had never seen. It lifted from her shoulders as if caught in a breeze. She crouched, breathing hard as if she'd been running, and her arms were stuck straight out. 
Her fox-like features and delicately pointed ears belonged to a creature from another world. Vandra blinked, and the woman vanished. The twins ran to Vandra's side, weapons pointed at the brigand in the grass. The brigand scrambled up, scrambled up, looking for her club, but Peter darted into her path. She dashed out of his way. Fida leapt to the side, swinging the butt of her heavy spear. It smacked against the brigand's head, and she fell senseless to the ground. Van, Peter asked, are you okay? I'm fine, she said. She searched the road for the mysterious woman and saw only scuffs in the dirt by the road. Did you see? She looked to the twins, noting their sweaty faces, but neither of them was bleeding, at least. Are you okay? Not even winded, Fida said as she clapped Vandra on the shoulder. And what got into you, Van? This one came at you with a club and you threw her into the ditch? I didn't know you had it in you. She grinned. <laughs> or did she rush you and trip? There was a woman! Vandra strode to the spot where the woman had appeared. She waved her hands in the air but felt nothing. Where? Peter asked. She disappeared, Vandra said. When the twins glanced at each other, she knew what they were thinking. <laughs> I'm not hallucinating and I don't imagine things. Then you've developed the power to manifest mystery women from thin air, Fiona said. No, Vandra said she was here. I don't know how she... Wait. The features, the ears, the hair, and she vanished. Aseli, Vandra said. She looked to the woods but saw nothing. Aseli saved me. And a beautiful one, but she didn't say that part out loud. Why would she do such a thing? The twins were staring at the brigand, not listening. What should we do with these thieves, Peter asked. Fiona glanced around. We can't march them all the way back town, back home, and we don't have time to find a village to take them. I don't want to take them anyway, Peter said. We don't have manacles or supplies. Fida shrugged. Let's just take their weapons and leave them for Van's imaginary savior. <laughs> Vandra glared, but Fida wasn't paying attention. They took the clubs and left the small knives so the brigands could live off the land, at least. Vandra didn't know if that was enough for people desperate enough to hunt this far north. Hopefully this would force them closer to a settlement. To prey on the people there? Vandra couldn't think too hard about it at the moment. It was the old problem of too many people living in too small a space. Something had to be done. Maybe, maybe the Sealy would help. She stared into the trees. If the Sealy were willing to save her from a brigand, maybe they'd help in other ways, too. Or maybe they simply hated an unfair fight and took pity on someone who clearly didn't know what she was doing. Either way, Vandra lifted a hand in thanks, hoping the purple-eyed Sealy was watching. Lilani crouched in the forest, but when Vandra waved, she smiled, tempted to return the gesture. One glance at Phelan's stony face convinced her to keep her hand down. He radiated disapproval. I had to, she said quietly. He kept staring. Go on, she said. Tell me how disappointed you are. How foolish I am. With a sniff, he looked away. I knew something like this would happen. I knew you'd throw yourself at a human if you ever met one. I did not, she said. But she had, literally. I had to help her, she said. Any minute now, he said, you'll be picking flowers for her and composing a love ballad. The lady put her hands on her hips. <laughs> I will not. He couldn't know that she picked her kissing the one called Vandra after that heroic rescue. Give it time, he said. She glared, but he seemed more tired than angry. If he'd been alone, would he have helped the humans? She didn't have the heart to ask. She'd made the right decision. Vandra and her warriors didn't kill the thieves, disarming them instead. They weren't the paragons of wanton destruction that the stories made them out to be. When they continued on their way, Lelani followed from inside the trees. Phelan grumbled as he trailed her. Lelani tried to ignore him, watching her humans instead. The warriors seemed lively, smiling together, giving each other playful shoves. Vandra was more composed, more seely. None were loud brutes. Without the flutter of magic, Vandra seemed quieter than even some seely. Lelani cocked her head. She thought before that the seely were like the wind and the humans were like the earth. But maybe the humans were like water instead, ever changing. Vandra stared into the forest from time to time. She had obviously deduced what Lelani was, and knew Lelani wasn't a threat, but she was also wise enough not to venture into the forest looking for her savior. She was smart and beautiful. The sight of her large, dark eyes and curvy figure would remain in Lelani's thoughts for a long time to come. She sighed. By the elders, Phelan was right. That was the start of a love ballad if she'd ever heard one. <coughs> Everybody use up their questions on JC. <laughs> Barbara, are you writing a sequel to this one? Uh, not at the moment. Um, I usually don't write a sequel until I see how the first one sells. Oh, yeah. Uh, if it sells really well, then I'll do another one, but if not, 
That's why I try to make them stand on their own if they can, and then I'll always have things in mind of, I could do this and I could do that, but if people don't want to read it, then... It's the best book you've ever written. Oh, thank you so much. You're welcome. That means the that rest of them are crap. No, <laughs> no, you know? I know, I'm just giving her... It's five stars, so that's it. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make a statement. Um, your Pyramid Vault series for Wanda the Fiend and all those, mm -hmm. um, when I was going through uh, knee replacement surgery, uh, they got me through a lot of uh, days of um, ch challenging days, let's put it that way. And uh, it was great escapism and getting to a whole different world where there's no homophobia and it's just natural to, to pair off with the same gender or, or not, you know. And uh, I just wanted to applaud you for your creating those different worlds and, you know, that great escapism. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. I'm, I'm always glad to hear that. That's one of the reasons why I wrote the novel in the first place, because I was tired of fantasy worlds, either having the women just be like barmaids and wives and this, and they're constantly beaten up and all of that, or uh, if, they, if they did have women or even gay characters, they were just, they're doomed. You know, they're gonna be killed for their, for their, for their gayness. Um, so I wanted one where like, no one cared. Where did you get your idea for the Paladins? I didn't mean to hog all the questions, I'm sorry. The, uh, the Paladin, Paladin series. Um, I actually, I've, I've wanted to write that one for a long time. Um, the, it very, the idea came to me um, way back when I was in college, back in the midst of time. And um, I was actually walking with some friends. We took a shortcut across a field when we were walking to go get dinner. And there was a small piece of broken sign, and it said, very sharp teeth. And that's just stayed with me, and I don't know what the sign was for or, or what. Um, I kind of wish I'd picked it up at the, at the moment, but that stayed with me, and it became the aliens from that book, and then this whole thing just exploded. And I actually wrote a short story based on that, and I entered it in the, um, let's see if I can get this whole thing right, Isaac Asimov Undergraduate Science Fiction and Fantasy Contest. <laughs> and uh, I got second place, um, which encouraged me to then write a novel and then Years later, here I am. You're probably the only person I know in writing that actually has protagonists with horns. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, that's from the Pyramid Walt series. My um, protagonists are part uh, demon, I guess you'd say. Fiends. Fiends, I call them fiends, yes, but they're, <laughs> they're part monster, and that's one of the secrets they have to keep in that book. What's a fa your most favorite? To write or my favorite story? Probably Paladins in that whole series because it's been with me so long. Um, I, I tried to sell that one as it was for years, um, but at the Pyramid Wall made be my first sale. Ended up being my first sale. Um, but I, I, I love the book and I love those characters. And the final book comes out in March. Oh, good. Oh, and uh, then I'm going to really miss them, you know, after <laughs> that's done. Um, especially writing the villains for that one was so much fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because dreading people that are truly terrible people, you know, that still, uh, you can make, if I can make them sympathetic in any way, and yet they're still awful, just awful people, that's always fun to write. Because, you know, there's always stuff you want to say you can't, and your villains can just blurt it out. <laughs> <laughs> So when you're, you said that was the, your longest, you've been with that series the longest time, and you've written it, in between you've written other books, right? Yes. How hard is it to switch from that world to other worlds? Um, much easier if I'm writing fantasy while I'm writing that one, because that one's sci-fi. But it's, it's so different from a, a fantasy novel that's set on a different world with people who have a completely different history. Um, you really have to watch your language I mean, not just swearing, but like references to things and you know things found in Earth and idioms that wouldn't make sense and all this. But um, with paladins, they're all from Earth. It's just set on different planets, so I could just you know do whatever. So um, that wasn't that hard. Um, remembering where I left off, that was hard. <laughs> and going back to my notes where I have all my character names and what color their hair is and all that stuff, that was difficult to me. <laughs> make sure everybody was the same. 
did you ever go through it and say, oh, I think I put this in here and then do it, and then read down a couple more lines and oh, I already did it? Yeah, yeah, all the time. All the time. I've re repeated days. I've had people say things over and over and over again because I don't go back and read. When I'm doing a first draft, I just go. Mm -hmm. So I'll be like, oh, I want to make sure everybody knows uh, this character is a sister. So it'll be like every time she comes on stage, she'll be like, have you heard of my sister? My sister said my sister likes toast. <laughs> and um, then I, I'll go back and read it before I give it to my beta readers. And they're like, you know, damn. This sister's awfully important for not even being in this novel. <laughs> Um, not really. Uh, they both have things to recommend them. The hardest thing about standalones is reining myself in. Um, this series, I can drop little hints about things that are coming, you know, or say, have little threads that left on pulled until the end. But in standalones, you have to wrap all that up. And you can say, you know, you can give hints that life goes on after this novel. You know, these characters <coughs> continue on and do their thing. Um, but knowing that you might never write those things is a little hard but series have their own troubles because um series always sell less well than standalones um and then they uh you have to keep thinking of new things new for these characters to get into and sometimes with some very long-running series that i've read i feel sorry for the people because they don't ever get a chance to like sit down you know they're always running from one crisis to the next I just wanted to ask you, um, there's like a running thread I've, I've noticed in your books where there's uh, at least one or, or several characters that find an inner strength that they didn't know they had or, or a, like with a paladin they develop these superpowers and all that stuff. Is that something you, you find within yourself or? Uh, I think yes, definitely. Every time something happens. And I think I'm not going to survive this, or I can't handle this, and then I do. And um, I have rheumatoid arthritis, um, which makes some days very, very hard. And I have to go through a lot of medical procedures, and sometimes I think, you know, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do this anymore. But then I'm like, what? Well, you know, <laughs> what's my other option? I'm just going to, you know, walk into a river, you know, or something and disappear. I was like, I don't want to do that. So yeah, everything time something bad happens, I, I have to think that, you know. How am I going to live through this? And then it's like, well, you know, you're, you're either gonna or you're not. Um, but now I've noticed that too. Also themes of running water, and I have no idea where that comes from. That's in a bunch of my books. And then uh, uh, terrible fathers, but I know exactly where that one comes from. <laughs> uh, for this longest time, I had, a, I had a boss when I was in college, and he was a real dick. And there's no other word for it. And, uh, and he showed up a lot in my fiction, getting run over by various things. <laughs> but I did, I did learn a lot from him about, about terrible people, and that was nice. <laughs> I think perhaps a, a little known secret is that a lot of authors can revenge characters' <laughs> life by putting them in their fiction that, that is and true. having them get their just desserts. Oh. Yeah, that is that is nice, and also it's nice if you've got, you know, if you're having an angry day that you can write an angry scene. The only problem that comes if you had an angry day and then you have to write, say, a love scene or something very tender, and you're like, I, I just usually write in brackets, love scene goes here or something if I have days like that, and then I have to come back because my beta readers will be like, no, 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 no. You know, you don't get to cheat us out of the sex. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that editor would send that back to me too with just laughter. <laughs> Are the sex scenes the hardest thing for you to write? Not really, because I don't write graphic sex scenes. You know, it's yeah. very much, oh, it's the best thing she ever felt. Never. <laughs> <laughs> Electricity exploding through her body. No, um, the hardest things are probably the end where you're having to wrap everything up. And you have to show that a character has changed in a certain way without the character going, I've changed, I'm a different person. <laughs> um, so that's, that's supposed to be kind of a slow arc and sometimes that's hard because you're like, ah, you know, I want her to have changed and he hasn't changed yet, so I'm just gonna write that she's like, epiphany. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, I'm a different person. <laughs> that one and uh, getting the voices of different characters right because you don't want them to sound exactly the same even in the narrative. 
So getting the sound, a, a lot of times when I start a book, they sound exactly the same, and I have to go back and change it. Do you ever get any pressure to add more sex to your books? I mean, one of the reputations that Bow Strokes has is they write really graphic sex scenes in a lot of their novels. Bold Strokes has never pressured me to write more sex. Um, they, they know that, that um, I, when I write a fantasy romance, usually the fantasy is coming first with a very heavy romantic plot line. They've never pressured me to write graphic sex. Um, some of my readers have asked for more sex. Um, somebody in, uh, they wanted like this really graphic sex scene in the Pyramid Wolf. Uh, no, I don't do that. Um, probably because I, I can't write the word clitoris without laughing. Um, <laughs> so it'd be a really long time before I turn that in, and also my editor would probably be like, this is wrong, that's wrong, no one does that. <laughs> um, so now, not from bold strokes. Does anybody else think it's more romantic that there's not graphic sex? Yes. Because mm -hmm. it leads it to the imagination, I think, so. Well, I think some, some people think that when they're reading lesbian fiction, that equals porn. And it's, it's not necessarily their fault because maybe that's what they've always thought of. And, oh, and it's the same people who think that if you're uh, gay in any way, then sex is like this most important part of your life, or that's what they want to boil you down to, or all this stuff. And you say, no, I have a whole life. Um, so I, I've, heard that, I've heard that in a lot of ways. A lot of people like the, the, the sort of um, curtains waving in the breeze sort of sex scene, and a lot of people want the really graphic stuff. And I always tell them, if they want that, it's out there. Um, I'll tell them where to go to find it, because I know. Um, <laughs> so I'm always like, you know, this is where you can go to get that, but I, I just don't do it because I want to, I like the kicking down the doors sort of scenes better. And I like the expressions of love, you know, oh, we found out we love each other over the body of this brigand. Um, but the story as a whole is more important. I figure I find that sometimes in my books, I'm like, if, if I stopped to have a really graphic sex scene, it would feel almost like it's halting the story so that we can, you know, really look under the sheets. <laughs> yeah. Um, kind of on the same subject, because um, I, I love to write in my, I've, I've never published, I dabble, but, but back in my other life, when I saw myself as hetero, I, I read romance specifically because I loved sex. <laughs> and I didn't think that one could one had to detract from the other. It could be very sexual but still very romantic. So I guess that hasn't changed since, you know, now that I read, you know, I should say my wife reads me lesbian books because they don't come in braille very much. Aww. But, uh, yeah, it sucks. But, um, <laughs> so I guess, I guess maybe the question would be, is there, is there always a, is there a divide where if it's graphic, it's not romantic, but if it's romantic, it's not graphic, or can you have both? I think you can definitely have both, especially if the story is, say, a romance first, or a contemporary romance, or something where it's like, this is the focus, this is the plot, this is what you'll be looking at the entire time, is watching these two characters get close to one another. Then I think it's definitely... It's definitely in there, and, and especially if you're reading something like erotica, of course, then the sex is paramount and the romance is secondary. Um, but they can still absolutely have them both. It's just for mine, I always thought that would be a shift in focus, because um, I, I think of mine as fantasy first and romance second, um, even when the, the romantic plot line is very, very strong. And so, also, my characters run around a lot, so they don't have time. I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> um, it, I feel like it's kind of like a horror movie that if they stop to have sex, then the horror would come and get them. Um, so they've got to keep running. Um, but no, I think you can absolutely have both. And I've, I've read stories incorporate both just lovely. And then my other, I don't know if I'm hogging questions, but you're fine. Because I've kind of shifted perspective, I've kind of shifted perspective in my writing. Like when I, you know, what, 20 years ago when I thought of myself as hetero, and then even for a while I was considered myself bi. Um, I wrote stories with all kinds of, you know, I had story ideas where there was all kinds of relationships in them. So now that I've shifted, it's like there's this, you know, I don't really want to write a male-female sex scene because I don't find them very attractive myself anymore, but yet the love story that I wrote back at the time, you know, like if I wanted to rewrite and publish it, you know, the original story that I wrote had that. So, um, you know, is there you know, as a, 
you know, is that something that, I don't know what my question is. I think I, think I, know, I know some of her writing, what she's asking basically <laughs> is when there's, when there's an, an evolving of the character, say uh, somebody is coming out of a marriage and it's their first female lover, then it's it's part of the story where um, a sex scene is kind of a revelation for her, um, and for a, some of Kelly's writing, that's kind of the situation. And um, if you were writing a book of that nature, would you write a sex scene? I might if it was uh, if if it if if it was was um, necessary for the plot. Absolutely. Um, especially if the, I think a lot of lesbian fiction, especially, is is the same kind of story. Um, I, I've read I've read a few of them. Erin um, O'Reilly's um, "If I Were a Boy" that mm -hmm. was what it was called is a kind of a story just like that, where it's a woman coming out of a hetero marriage, from her first female lover, and, uh, and, and and quite a few of them they can think, you know, I never sex is okay, or maybe even they enjoyed it, but you know, it never lit their hair on fire. <laughs> and then, you know, their first female love, that they're like, aha, you know, the thing that I've always been missing. And I think the other part of the question, too, is, you know, should I go back and, like, and gay, you know, lesbianize my, my hetero characters because I want to write that, I want to write that love scene, dang it, but I really don't want any, you well, know, you know. Well, rather than, sh than change your, your character's uh, uh, sexual identity, I would say maybe just write a different story, write okay. a new story. Um, but you could absolutely have a heterosex scene if it was if the plot called for it. Um, so you, I don't use my part as a lesbian. You, you <laughs> don't. You don't. You don't use your lesbian part. If I want to be true to my characters, then they're hetero dog on it, and I want to write that love scene. I'm still okay, right? I'm you you are if you if it's very graphic. Um, you you might you might get some pushback. Okay. Um, I have written so in the Paladin series, I have uh, all kinds of different couples all over the spectrum, and including hetero couples. And I write the same kind of sex scenes for them as I do for everybody else. Where it's just it's much more about the feelings yeah. than it is about the body parts. Okay. Um, and uh, and that is actually my um, least well-selling series, and I don't know if it's because of that or if it's because it's a giant sprawling sci-fi epic with like 50 million characters. It's not. Go buy it. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, so I think if you wrote a graphic heterosex scene, um, there might be a little meh. But if it's like, you know, she's having sex with her husband and she's kind of meh, and then later she has sex with a female lover and she's like, woohoo, you know, I think it definitely, uh, there'd be a lot of people who would identify with that. Okay. So just... If I write some other story, don't put it as lesbian fiction, and I'll be okay. <laughs> uh, you know, I can tell you about the marketing part. That is not my department. But I will say, just just write it the way you want to write it. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So, because if you're writing bisexual fiction, you might have a character who has all kinds of sex scenes. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Barbara, you've got a, a foot in several literary worlds, and I know you attend fantasy and sci-fi conferences, and I'm wondering. Is lesbian fiction accepted in those little niches in the literary community? Um, so there are like two um, polar opposites. So you get people who are surprised and who think it's porn. Those people are, you know, are way over here. And then you get people who are like, oh my god, yes please, I've never heard of such a thing. Um, most of the people there are just kind of like, oh. You know, and I've, I've actually been very surprised by the amount of young people who were kind of scared of it, not because they're, they're scared of the, of, of the scary lesbians, but because they think it's either, they think something terrible is going to happen to the lesbians and they don't want to read about that. And I, I have to assure them, no, no, you know, that's not, that's not me, you know, they're going to make it. Because um, I tell them, you know, it's one hallmark of romance is kind of a happy ending, and I say, I do, I, I do happy endings. So. And um, so, you know, you don't have to worry that I'm going to introduce this fabulous lesbian character just to kill her. That and most of the people in my books are somewhat gay. <laughs> Especially in the Paladins universe, it's pretty much just everybody yeah. kind of binds that people have preferences. Um, so, yeah, the, the young people who are scared of terrible things happening to their favorite characters, that's hard to see. And then once you assure them, they, they want to buy it. Um, so the old guard is kind of thinking porn, and then the, the newer, younger generation is, wants to wants to buy it. So it's really it's really weird to see these opposites. And I've sold books at sci-fi cons before, 
And the number of people who come by who are like, you know, oh, that's uh, you know, it sounds good. And then the number of people who are like, oh, my stars, you know, gay agenda, come to life. Um, <laughs> luckily, there's not that many of those people. Uh, those people. Well, generally, science fiction fandom, I'm not talking about fantasy so much, but science fiction fandom, the old guard doesn't really like romance in their science fiction. That's true, that's true, and uh, a lot of the old guard is uh, dying. dying, which is good. Um, they're also, <laughs> but see, they're, they're stopped from the beginning because a lot of them don't want women in the that's story true, role yeah, already, true. so if they're like, they're women and they're lesbians, and there's a romance heavy, have romance heavy, sub, heavy romance subplot, then they're like, they're out. I mean, but they were out when they huddle women holding a sword, she's not wearing a bikini. So I mean, <laughs> who cares what they think anymore? I'm, just as long, every time I go to a sci-fi con, they put me on the diversity panel, which I always think is <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't there a con recently where they had a diversity panel, but nothing about diversity? There was, um, there was a, a, there's been several. There, my favorite was, um, I, I believe at one of the bigger cons, they had a women in comics panel with no women. Um, and then, uh, yeah, they had a diversity panel um, with barely anybody on it. Um, or they're like a, you know, you have to, you, it's, somebody once said that, you know, people talk about coming out stories. And it's like, if you're gay or bi or lesbian or trans or whatever, you have to come out over and over and over again. It's not just one story. Because if you put me on a diversity panel, people are going to be like, how? You know, so I have to be like, okay, you know, I am your token gay person. Um, <laughs> and the people are like, how do I write the gay people? It's just just write people. Uh, yes, but it's very nice in a way to be like, oh, you know, thank you. Thank you for being embraced. And then maybe guilt them into buying the book because you're like, well, you know, you, you support gay people. $15. But, um. <laughs> But no, I'm, I'm happy that it's there. Yeah, one more. Yeah, I'm like, oh. yeah, I'm um, Okay, another question, and this has to do with my writing, so I'm just curious how this, you know, what you think as a writer. But um, I'm like a femme who has attracted other femmes, so I especially enjoy the books where the characters are, you know, the two, the romantic plot has two characters that are femme or femme-ish, you know, mm. maybe like maybe very soft butch, but. So is that kind of thing like, um, and again, I don't read a lot of lesbian books in Braille. My wife reads everything to me that I have, right. <laughs> that I've heard. So um, is there, is that sort of considered okay? Or are you so, is, yeah. it, is it more? No, everything is okay. Doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. It's not required to write a butch family nope. if you prefer uh, 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 no. butch butch or whatever. Very much no. Anything, anything is okay. The world is wide and full of all different kinds of people. Okay. So no, Do write what you want. Cool beans. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, why don't we take a short break, stretch, grab something to drink, look at the books, and then we'll come back and if there are any further questions, and uh, then we'll do the drawing, so make, make sure you filled out the, uh, the registration card. Okay.